For Crema Media's Polity, I'm Shannon Derehove. Opposition to Urban Tolling Alliance Chairperson Wayne Duvenage and ghostwriter Angelique Sorrell join me to discuss their first book, The Etoll Saga. Your book recounts your journey from a conscientious corporate CEO into the role of corporate activist against electronic tolling in Gauteng. Why did you decide to focus all your energy and resources into fighting this particular cause? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's a conscientious decision as well. <coughs> um, it's, it's a long story, but to cut it short, uh, I was in a space of, of needing to change. I'd been five years as CEO, and the e-tolling matter was just too big not to challenge, and nothing was happening at the time. There was a lot of noise, a lot of energy out there, negative energy, frustration around e-tolls as the story unfolded throughout 2011. Um, and it needed a, a, a hard and honest challenge. And, and I must stress here that <coughs> ARTA is not the enemy of Sanral. It's not the enemy of government. It is the conscience of government. And, and our role was to merely highlight what was so damaging and so wrong with the system. And everything we predicted has come true. All the irrationality, the cumbersomeness of the process, the administrative burden uh, that surrounds the system, which all leads to defiance. And we cautioned them. And in fact, they were cautioned by their own advisors. And, and, and I just felt that if nothing was going to be done, and this is something that needed full-time energy from leadership, from people who understood it, um, I guess it just it cascaded into this space. It wasn't a conscious decision at the time, but, but, but when the timing was right, I uh, made the decision to leave, uh, help set up ARTA, which had already been set up, by the way, just needed leadership. And, um, and we set off, but this wasn't about one person. This is about a team of people. This is about journalists writing the stories around the work that Angelique was doing and other journalists. This is about the energy of society that uh, needed to be just funneled and channeled, and we needed to uh, uh, hold government to account. We needed to hold Sanral, to be honest. We needed to challenge the misinformation, and there was a ton of misinformation that was going out there. So that's really what it's about. The opposition to Urban Tolling Alliance sprang up from nothing and became a highly rated brand in the not-for-profit space in a matter of a few months. Tell us about your role in Outer's success. Well, as I said, it's a, it's a team effort. Um, <clears throat> Outer was a, a, a culmination of a number of big business organizations getting together to challenge something that needed to be challenged. And I think e-tolling was an emotive topic. It was, uh, and when we got that interdict, when we stopped the launch on the 30th of April in 2012, it was a massive win for society. Suddenly the public sat up and said, hey, we can challenge this. And we were funded by the public and business. Um, and I guess that released a lot of energy and society is becoming extremely frustrated at government's extractive mindset at its continuous increasing in taxation and people are getting uh, really hard pressed uh, in this space and they need to release that energy positively and I think Arta gave them that outlet to do so. <clears throat> it, is a, it is a brand with integrity, it is a trusted brand, we're here for the people, we're funded by the people and Arta has a bigger role to play now going forward. We want to extend our um, energy into challenging Sanro on so many other issues that we've come to know that have to be challenged. The Wild Coast Tolling Initiative is an absolute farce. The Western Cape issues, we've been asked to help in a number of other areas. The whole tolling mechanism in this country is extractive and I think Sanro needs to know <coughs> that its role is to do what is in the best interest of society and the public and we believe it isn't behaving in that manner and I think um, Arta is going to play a bigger role in that space. What has been your greatest challenge in the fight against e-tolls? Well, I think it's, uh, it's two. Uh, first of all, it's government's bully boy tactics. Um, <clears throat> we've got evidence, and you see about it in the book, Sanral and government leans heavily on its critics. Uh, and that in turn leads to a, a, a lack of funding from big business. We know that big business realizes, and they've put it out there in business uh, financial statements, that tolling is not right, it's expensive, they're passing the costs on, it's inefficient, there's so many errors in the system, uh, yet they can't step up in their game and they cannot step out of their, uh, uh, the zone that they have to, to support an organization like ARTA because they know that government is a bully, government comes down hard on its critics, government doesn't like its critics. So, so uh, that's one of the challenges and that then leads to this dearth, this, this difficulty to fund. And you know when government dips into taxpayers pots to fight its court cases, and there are many, I'd love to know what Sanral's legal bills have been over the last six to eight years, and they've been in court so many times it's got to tell you something. Um, <clears throat> 
and yet they continuously go through this uh, attrition through lawfare. They just they just try and wear their opponents out. Why? Because they can. They just dip into the taxpayers' pot to fund their marketing campaigns, their misinformation, their propaganda, their legal expenses. And yet we have to go and beg for money from business and society. And society and business are helping us. So I think we have a role to play. But again, I must stress, this is not about, uh, uh, you know, as, as Vuzi Mona has said, you know, we, we're making a career out of challenging Sanra. I mean, we don't get paid a cent for this. This is not about that. This is about challenging something that's fundamentally flawed, wrong. It is an absolute farce, this e-tiling thing. And, and, and I think that um, Arta's brand and integrity is as a result of, of, of us sticking to our guns. Electronic tolling has been a disaster for Sanrail and an embarrassment for the South African government under President Jacob Zuma. What do you think should happen as the saga unfolds? Well, e-tolling should be halted. There's no doubt about it. You know, they were supposed to launch in April 2011. We are now in 2015 and the system has failed completely. They have not, never been able to get the reg regulatory environment right. You would think that in 2012 when the, the, when the Constitutional Court set aside our interdict and, and said they can start tolling, and they said they would start within two weeks, everything would be in place and they could start. As they said they would and they couldn't. They couldn't start for another year. That tells you something. Right now, the tariffs are wrong again. The taxis that are exempt aren't even tagged. Over the last 18 months, they said 46,000 taxis are, 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 are in the system. They're not. You go and find out there's not one tag on taxis in the, in the, in the system. <clears throat> now, when, it, when a system is offered for free and it doesn't work, well, then you know something's wrong. So, you know, I'm hoping that there's going to be some senior politicians in the ANC, in the governing party, to read this book. When they read it, they'll understand why the scheme is just so fundamentally flawed, why it will never work here. We're not opposed to tolling, by the way. We're opposed, uh, you know, we've seen intelligent transport systems work and why they work. It's just that there are eight critical factors that are required to be successful, and Sanral doesn't tick one of those boxes on the scheme. And that's why it has always been doomed to fail. It will fail, no matter what stick government wants to force its citizens to comply, they will never comply, not in the numbers that are, that are required. So we're saying to government, you know, we're not here to rub mud in your faces, we're not here to ridicule you, we had to say, work with us, we are your critics for a reason, to hold you accountable, to behold you honest and true to your mandate to serve the citizens properly and most uh, efficiently, and we'll work with you to find the solution. So, so, you know, just stop the nonsense. How should the roads be paid? Well, the roads have been paid for, let me tell you. Uh, government has an existing fuel levy option. It uses that fuel levy to fund roads. It gives Sanral billions, 12 billion, 12 and a half billion rand now a year goes to Sanral to fund road upgrading. You must understand these are not long distance routes which we take occasionally. These are urban roads which we take daily. They are social infrastructure and economic infrastructure than necessary. In fact, we've always said that, you know, Gateng, which is a positive outflow into the national fiscus, and it gets back only a quarter of what it pumps into the national fiscus. If this little rich province needs eight lane highways, give it to them because the more productive we are, the better. And the easiest way to do that is the fuel levy. Why do we say that? Because the fuel levy attracts zero cost and the e-tolls attracts over a billion rand cost a year just to administer. So weigh that up, zero to one over a billion rand. And you've got to ask yourself, what could we do with that billion rand? The other thing about the fuel levy and, and um, and e-tolls is e-tolls will never have the 100% compliance or 90% plus compliance it needs. Whereas uh, the fuel levy does, it has 100% compliance barring a few electric cars out there. So you've got to ask yourself, why do you want to take the cumbersome expensive route? On top of that, the fuel levy now brings in an extra 30 billion rand a year than, than it did uh, in 20, 2008 when the, when the construction started. <clears throat> you could pay for two GFIPs cash, in fact three cash every year just with the increase in the fuel levy since the roads were built here. So the money's there, government have got the money, they mustn't say they don't have it. The only argument is that, you know, why should people in other provinces pay? And we've said all along, but we are paying for their roads, their hospitals, so really their argument just doesn't make sense. Your book describes how to mobilize an active citizenry to work towards positive transformation in South Africa. How did you do this and what would you say to citizens who are paying e-tolls? Well, I think the first thing is, you know, <clears throat> civil society action groups exist for one reason. 
it is to hold government to account, to challenge them on what they're doing. There would be no more want wanted situation than having no civil society or no need for civil, civil action groups. Let's take the treatment action campaign. Let's take section 27, the right to know campaign. All of those civil society organizations exist because there's a flaw. Something's gone wrong in the system. Government are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're not true to their citizens. That's exactly why Outer is formed. I think Outer's success has been it was very quick. It was quick because it was an emotive topic <clears throat> and it was a real topic. It wasn't just a, a pseudo challenge that you know we, we, we trumped up and thought, well, let's go and make careers out of this. We had careers. We, we do went about this the right way. So. There's no doubt that um, social media has been extremely helpful fighting a government that uses millions of taxpayers' money to try and sell an unjust system. We had, uh, don't spend one cent, and yet they still can't get it right. So, um, you know, it, it's about having a good mandate, a good constitution, good people uh, uh, that, that work hard in fighting the scheme and being available to the press and available to the media to tell your side of the story, to be honest and to expose the misinformation that Sanral puts out there. What we say to people who um, are tolling or, or part of the system is that's their choice. You know, we're not here to say you're wrong to get an e-tag and to pay. But what we are saying is that at the height of this campaign a year ago in, uh, in winter 2014 when Sanral were threatening to arrest people, they couldn't even get more than half the people to pay. 45% was the maximum compliance they got to. How do we know that? Well, they've confirmed that. The ministers have confirmed that in Parliament. Uh, we said they would never get the compliance levels where they needed to. And what we say to those 1.5 million motorists who held out, well done, your civil courage has made the system fail, not outer, their civil courage. And what we say to people is if we continue to stand our ground as citizens for what is right and defy the system, we will win in the long run. Sanral will never, and the government will never be able to do what it thinks it can do with its citizens. We will defy unjust laws. Why? Because it is our duty and our responsibility to defy unjust policies. This one is unjust. This one is the biggest farce I've seen in my life. The book details some valuable lessons on what makes a civil organization effective. Please elaborate on the lessons you've learned on your journey to become a corporate activist. Well, there's so many, hey? you know. Um, I think the biggest thing in, in, in going down this journey is you've got to have energy. No, no system survives without energy. Where does energy come from? It comes from two things. It comes from leadership and funding. If we get the resources and the funding, we can bring more people into the system, our system, and then hold government to account. In fact, what we've learned is that government doesn't like its critics, as I've said, and, and, and in effect it should. It should embrace uh, an outer. It should embrace Section 27 because a mature government, one that realizes that civil society's role is to hold it accountable and hold it honest, uh, the president and the deputy president should be saying, let's make sure these civil action groups survive, let's fund them if need be, because they are holding our various leaders around the country accountable. Books being delivered in Limpopo, the hospitals being run properly, tolling being in the best interests of society and so forth. And Instead, we found government goes into its lager, it, goes, it puts its blinkers on, it hates its critics, and it starts threatening people who support its critics. And that's a sad, sad situation to be in, because that's not what Mediba was all about. That's not what we fought for. That's not why we bought apartheid to an end. That's how the apartheid government used to operate, in this lager mentality, and we're seeing our government go straight back into this space. And uh, we need a mechanism um, and, and I think that's what we've learned all along is that we need to be true to ourselves and hold government to account and, and it's, you're going to find more and more about this and, and Outer's role going forward is to play an even more meaningful role in holding government to account. We have to challenge the carbon tax. Why? It is wrong. We have to challenge this nuclear deal that's happening. It's not good for this country. We have to challenge so many other things that are not good for this country and I think if there's anything we've learned it's that we can do it as, as the people. Now, Angelique, can you please explain how you balance your role as editor of investigations at the Star newspaper, where objective reporting is required on the pros and cons of e-tolling, against your role in writing a book that actively campaigns against the e-toll system? Well, I think um, there's two answers to that question. The first is that I wear two different hats. Um, 
I, when I go to my job at the Star, that is exactly what I do. I will always, always write fair and balanced reporting. Um, but I think investigations by its nature are probing. Um, to, to do investigative type stories, you might not be seen as fair simply because you are digging deep into things. That doesn't mean you're not going to give somebody a fair voice and, and proper rights to reply. But the nature of investigative reporting is like that. So I think in a way it actually fits, it fits well together. And I always have very good supporting editors. Um, if ever there's any kind of conflict of interest, I've got fantastic colleagues that I'd be more than happy to pass things on to. And you know, we all do that within, within um, our job and our space. If there's something we don't feel comfortable with, we just pass it on to a colleague. It doesn't mean the story won't be told, because it always will be. And the second, the second aspect of it is, it was a natural progression. Um, a lot of this book is recounting, as it said, the Ethel saga. So it's about what happened in that space. Mm -hmm. And the stories that I did in 2011, 2012 are a part of that. Um, and, and with Wayne, you know, it was, it was an interesting combination because I was bringing in some of the outside aspects into the story. Mm -hmm. So I was saying, um, but you know, government said this at this stage, and with Simona said that. And I brought that, that kind of element into the story, which brought that outside element. So it worked very well together. Take me through the process of ghostwriting this book. How did you collaborate with Wayne and decide on which aspects to focus on? Well, um, it was an interesting time in my life because, because I was pregnant, I was working my full-time job, um, I got a toddler at home. So we met um, lots of early, early mornings. <laughs> Um, and essentially what we did was, I, I was Wayne would tell his story, I would record him, and then I, I'd bring in the outside research and we put it all together. Um, it did become quite difficult in the end on, on choosing what to write because there was so much. Um, and at some point we actually had to go, oh, enough, because this thing is just continuing, this Etol saga, it hasn't ended. And we had to put, off a, we had to put a cut-off point at some, at some stage. Uh, but I think, again, my role as a journalist helped in that because I naturally take uh, big issues and make them concise. Um, it's, it's a knack that I do have and I think that did help. Any more books? You never know. <laughs> You've got to watch that space. That was outer chairperson Wayne Duvenage and ghostwriter Angelique Sorrell speaking to Crema Media's Polity about their new book, The Etold Saga.